Should we stop putting all patients with heart failure on a fluid restriction when they're admitted to the hospital? This is basically a practice that has been handed down through multiple generations of medicine. And it's basically become this reflexive thing at this point where heart failure patient, put them on a fluid restriction. Heart failure patient, put them on a low sodium diet. But really, is the evidence good for that? So as you may know, there's this whole campaign called Choosing Wisely and uh, the things we do for no reason. And one of the things that they've actually talked about is putting patients on a fluid restriction in heart failure may actually be doing more harm than good. Obviously, the thought process of putting a patient on a fluid restriction kind of makes intuitive sense because they're coming in extremely volume overloaded. They've got fluid in their lungs. They've got fluid in their legs. They're 20 pounds overweight, all because of this water retention. So we should just slap them on a fluid restriction. But let's take a quick look at why the Choosing Wisely campaign actually suggests against doing fluid restriction. And I would like to point out that this was actually written by Shireen Jimenez, uh, who is actually one of the cardiologists who is currently practicing at UC Davis. So kind of funny to see what a small world it is. But uh, they first provide this clinical scenario. So the hospitalist enters admission orders for an 80-year-old woman with hypertension, coronary artery disease, and heart failure with reduced EF, who presented with weight gain, lower extremity edema, and dyspnea on exertion. She has an elevated jugular venous pressure, crackles on pulmonary exam, and bilateral pitting edema with warm extremities, so extremely fluid overloaded. After ordering intravenous furosemide for management of acute decompensated heart failure, the hospitalist arrives at the nutrition section of the admission order set and reflexively picks an option for a fluid restric restricted diet. They then go into a background of kind of what we do for the treatment of acute decompensated heart failure. And they did write that as part of the modern day treatment regimen, providers continue to place patients on fluid restricted diets. Guidelines even support this practice. Current iterations of American and European heart failure guidelines recommend fluid restriction of 1.5 to 2 liters per day in severe acute decompensated heart failure as a management strategy. The problem is that they based these guidelines based on the clinical experience and data from a single randomized trial that was evaluating the effects of sodium restriction on heart failure outcomes, not even evaluating fluid restriction in this scenario, and it was mainly just a subgroup analysis. So this trial randomly assigned 232 patients with compensated heart failure with reduced EF to either a normal or low sodium diet plus oral Lasix. Researchers then instructed both groups to adhere to a 1,000 milliliter per day fluid restriction. The authors found a high incidence of readmissions for worsening congestive heart failure among a cohort of patients with a normal sodium diet who were excluded from randomization due to inability to adhere to the prescribed fluid restriction. So it wasn't even a subgroup analysis. It was literally a group of patients that couldn't complete the protocol because it was too hard to adhere to a one liter fluid restriction. Like it was so hard, they just like literally could not even participate in this trial. And then somehow that led to us creating these guidelines that everybody should be fluid restricted. I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, especially because these patients weren't even the same group of kind of what we're talking about in patients who have acute decompensated heart failure. The baseline patient group for this randomized control trial was actually patients with compensated heart failure. So honestly, multiple, multiple red flags here where things don't really add up. Notably, the study did not evaluate patients receiving treatment for acute decompensated heart failure and was not designed to investigate the role of fluid restriction for treatment of ADHF. However, a subsequent study by the same investigators looked more deliberately, although, although not singularly, at outpatient fluid restriction. This study randomly assigned 410 patients with compensated heart failure, again, compensated instead of decompensated, which is usually what we're talking about in hospitalized patients, into eight groups by fluid intake, one liter versus two liter, salt intake, 80 millimoles versus 120 millimoles, and furosemide dose, 125 milligrams twice daily versus 250 milligrams twice daily. And this is how you know that we're really acting on some old guidelines here. Because while we do use fairly high doses of Lasix sometimes, like 120 milligrams, I really have never seen 250 milligrams of Lasix twice daily. So this study must have been extremely old. And you know, if we go to the citations for this, uh, this would be six and seven. Well, you can see when this was published. 2008 and 2008, that's actually not as old as I thought, um, but it's basically these studies conducted by Paterna et al. And they found in this study, which again didn't have the right baseline group, that at 180 days, the group receiving the fluid restricted diet with higher sodium intake and higher diuretic dose had the lowest risk of hospital readmission. 
So honestly, I'd probably have to take a quick look at this trial too to figure out really how this actually led to us fluid restricting everybody because there's like three different variables at play here. And not only that, the, this study is suggesting that we should put people on high sodium diet, which is something we don't do. So why are we picking and choosing, you know, let's just fluid restrict everybody and then also not do this higher sodium diet and super high diuretic dose. And, you know, all of these results could just be confounded by the fact that these patients were getting 250 milligrams of Lasix twice a day, which may have been the primary driver for why there was reduced hospital readmissions. And regarding low sodium diet for heart failure, I remember as an intern, I actually tried to look up the evidence base for that too. And while there were some studies suggesting that low sodium diets were helpful in heart failure, I actually didn't find super, super strong evidence, like really good randomized control trials showing that we should do low sodium diets. So I'm curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are about that as well. But anyways, results from these studies of the chronic compensated heart failure population in conjunction with long-standing conventional wisdom have influenced the management of patients hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure. So next, why fluid restriction in the management of decompensated heart failure might not be helpful? From a pathophysiologic perspective, fluid restriction in decompensated heart failure may counterproductively lead to RAS activation. Congestion develops when arterial underfilling leads to RAS activation, triggering sodium and water retention. Furthermore, RAS activation, as measured by plasma levels of renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone, correlates with prognosis and mortality in chronic hefra. So basically what they're saying here is that while these patients are total body volume up, they actually intravascularly are deplete. And so when the kidneys sense that, they're like, oh my gosh, we're actually volume down. We need to activate the RAS system and retain more water, retain more sodium. And so that actually leads to worsening congestion of your lungs and your legs and all this third spaced fluid. So when you actually put these patients on a fluid restriction, they're theorizing that this may actually make your body even more think that you're dehydrated and intravascularly deplete again, leading to further RAS activation and retention of water. The most relevant and compelling evidence against fluid restriction comes from Travers et al., who conducted the first randomized controlled trial examining fluid restriction in ADHF patients. Their small study compared restricted one liter fluid restriction versus liberal free fluid intake in hospitalized patients with ADHF and demonstrated no difference in duration or daily dose of IV diuretics time to symptomatic improvement, total daily fluid output, or average hospitalization weight loss between the two arms. Just reading the sentence, that sounds pretty convincing. Obviously, you need to take a look at the primary literature if you really want to analyze how well this study was conducted. But that really is, seems to be putting a pretty strong uh, argument forward that we don't need to be doing fluid restriction. Furthermore, researchers withdrew more patients in the fluid-restricted arm due to sustained rise in serum creatinine, suggesting potential harm of this intervention. So not only was the fluid restriction not beneficial compared to free fluid intake, but there was also a potential associated harm with it in terms of causing acute kidney injury. Unfortunately, the sample size of just 67 patients and the fluid intake difference of only 400 milliliters between the two groups limited the study results. In a subsequent randomized control trial, Alidi et al. examined the clinical outcomes of even more aggressive fluid restriction, 800 milliliters per day, which is pretty intense, and sodium restriction, 800 milligrams per day, which is super intense as well. We usually do like two grams per day versus liberal intake, at least 2.5 liters per day and approximately three to five grams per sodium per day in hospitalized patients. While this study evaluated both fluid and sodium restriction, it produced relevant results. The study demonstrated no significant difference in weight loss, use of diuretics, or rehospitalization between the study arms. At 30-day follow-up, researchers found that the patients in the intervention group which is the one with the aggressive fluid restriction and aggressive sodium restriction, had more congestion and an increased likelihood of having a BNP level greater than 700. Patients in the intervention group also had a significantly higher rate of readmission compared to controls, and the fluid restriction group had 50% higher perceived thirst compared to the control group. The sensation of thirst not only reduces quality of life, but given that angiotensin II stimulates thirst, it may reflect RAS activation, which is kind of what they theorized earlier. So really... No difference in weight loss, time of hospitalization, uh, diuretic use, but significant increase in rehospitalization in the fluid restricted group, significant worsening of thirst and decrease of quality of life, and then also ele elevated BMP level and congestion uh, at 30 day follow up. For these reasons, clinicians should consider this side effect seriously 
especially when the literature lacks evidence of the benefits of fluid restriction. The next section they talk about is when fluid restriction is helpful in the management of decompensated heart failure. And really, they said that you should only fluid restrict patients who have chronic hyponatremia, sodium less than 135, basically so you're not diluting the sodium as much. However, no available randomized data supports this practice either. So it's kind of take it or leave it, it's like expert consensus. They also touched upon that some people consider fluid and salt restriction in patients with advanced CKD. But again, there were no studies that examined the effects of fluid restriction in the CKD and decompensated heart failure population. What you should do instead. In the present day of evidence-based pharmacologic therapies, research indicates that fluid restriction does not help and potentially may harm. Instead, treat hospitalized HEFREF patients with ADHF with modern evidence-based pharmacologic therapies and allow the patients to drink when thirsty. So I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts on this. This is a very commonplace practice that literally everybody does. Everybody's placed on a 1.5 liter fluid restriction, 2 liter fluid restriction. And I'm curious to hear if this and knowing about this article will change your practice. Let me know down in the comments below if you're going to change your practice based on this. Personally, I have been definitely taking the liberty of liberalizing patients' fluid uh, restrictions, especially if I see 1.5 liters, I liberalize that ASAP. But to be honest, a lot of the patients that I've been admitting with decomposite heart failure, I've been putting them on like 2.5 liter fluid restriction. And mainly the reason I'm putting on 2.5 is because otherwise people are going to start contacting you and be like, hey, why is this patient not on a fluid restriction? But honestly, part of me kind of just wants to not put them on a fluid restriction at all based on reading this article. Personally, I think at the very least, we should be liberalizing patients' fluid intake at least a little bit. And I kind of think of this uh, the way I treat diabetes in the hospital. So a lot of times we have patients in the hospital with really uncontrolled diabetes, and we put them all on carb-controlled diets, and then we get them on a good insulin regimen, and we're like, yeah, this is working. But for some patients, there's a select few patients that you know, once they leave the hospital, they're not going to adhere to a carb-controlled diet, which is strictly monitored in the hospital. When they go home, they're going to be eating much more carbohydrate-rich foods. And so their sugars are not going to be controlled on whatever insulin regimen you have them on in the hospital. So sometimes it's actually beneficial that a couple days before discharge, you actually switch their carb-controlled diet to a regular diet to more simulate what they're going to be doing in like a real-world situation. And then you're going to see their sugars in that case. And then you can adjust their uh, insulin to be a little bit more optimized before they leave the hospital. In that same light, I think one of the reasons some of these patients probably came back with higher readmission rates and worsening congestion when they were placed on super strict fluid restriction of 800 milliliters a day or whatever, is probably because while that was possible in the hospital, there's no way that a patient is going to adhere to that strict of a fluid restriction as an outpatient. Even 1.5 liters a day is extremely hard for a patient to do. And so it almost seems beneficial to put the patient on a more liberal fluid intake uh, you know, schedule in the hospital, so up to 2.5 liters or maybe no fluid restriction, because that's going to more accurately represent what the patient is going to be doing in the real world. And so that will help you titrate their diuretic dose of Lasix or Bumex or Torsamide or whatever to a more accurate level that's going to keep them euvolemic as an outpatient. So aside from just helping with the quality of life standpoint of things, because hospitalized patients are always complaining about how thirsty they are when you put them on a fluid restriction, this may also just help you get them on the right medications and the right doses and prevent further readmissions and worsening congestion once they leave. So honestly, I think there's multiple benefits of liberalizing the fluid restrictions that we're giving patients. Again, I'm very curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are and if you're going to change your practice. I hope this was an interesting discussion. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.